Hello, everybody, and welcome in to the Arrowhead Addict Podcast. I am Matt Verderam, and I am flying solo today. Patrick Allen and most of the fan-sided crew are headed down to Orlando for a meetup this week. I am jealous, although it's going to be 94 and about 100% humidity for them, so good luck to them. Uh, I will be home. I have a two-month-old daughter, so if I went down to Orlando, I might as well stay there. Um, there is a lot to get to, which is odd because it's June 2nd, and so normally – there's not a lot to get to, if we're being totally honest, right? It's a lot of speculative stuff. It's maybe looking ahead to training camp, uh, which we'll do a little bit of as, as training camp is about seven weeks away or so. But there's actually some new news that just came out about 10 minutes before we started recording this podcast, and that is that Orlando Brown has an agent. His name is Michael Portner. Um, I am familiar with a lot of agents in the NFL. I am not familiar with Portner. I know. Um, he's, he's with the Delta group. Um, I think it's actually called the Delta sports group and he's, he's, he's based out of being down South. Um, but Orlando Brown has, has signed him on as an agent, which look, I think tells you if nothing else that Orlando Brown is now looking to get a deal done, right? If he wasn't looking to get a deal done, why would he go out and add an agent? And I'm going to pull up here in a second. I'm going to pull up the, the statement that he put out alongside his new agent. Uh, but I, I do think if you're a Chiefs fan and you want him locked up, this is probably a good sign. Doesn't mean something's going to happen tomorrow, but it does mean at least there's a willingness to, to start to do something here, or at least one would think. So it reads as this, and yes, uh, Michael Portner is part of the Delta Sports Group. And the statement is put out by that group. It says, uh, Delta Sports Group is proud to announce the signing of Father Brown Jr. as its first NFL client. Okay, which is why not a lot of uh, familiarity here. Um, DSG will represent all of those interests in contract negotiations, with NFL clubs, and off-field marketing opportunities. Um, look, I'm going to paraphrase the rest of it, but basically, uh, they felt that there was a, uh, as they put it, a unique personal connection, um, and they're also going to work uh, immediately to help uh, Orlando Brown make the impact he wants to make with the Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City. So that's great. Um, look, ultimately. It became official. You're in downtown Miami today, or, or maybe will be here in the coming hours. It says it'll be official today. So most players have agents throughout their entirety of their careers, right? Like very rarely does a player go without an agent for more than maybe about a day. Maybe they're switching agents. There are some, Richard Sherman among them. Um, Russell Okun didn't have an agent. Lamar Jackson doesn't have an agent. But it's Important to note here, now with Brown having an agent, this makes life a little easier for Brett Veach and Brant Tillis, who now are going to be negotiating with someone who that's all they do for a living. They negotiate contracts. Just because Brown is the first NFL client doesn't mean that this group hasn't negotiated many contracts before. Maybe this will be the biggest. Um, I'm not familiar with who else they have on the docket. But I do think it matters that he now has an agent. I wrote about Lamar Jackson on Monday in Stacking the Box, if you read it over at Fansided. I think it really complicates matters for the Ravens on Lamar Jackson. He doesn't have an agent. It's harder if you're a GM to tell a player bluntly, hey, look, man, we love to give you X, but we don't think you're as good as these three guys. We think you could work on this. Discontent gets sewn in, right? Bad feelings happen. Hard feelings happen. Agents they don't want to hear bad things about their players or, or not even bad, but just kind of criticisms, healthy criticisms. But they also understand that that's part of the deal. That's the way it works. It's not taken personally unless it's a personal insult. And, and if, it's, if it's a personal insult, then that's on the team. That should never happen. Um, I do believe that for Kansas City, this is – a development now that makes you feel better about the fact that you can get a deal done before the July 15th deadline. So for Kobe being asks, hey Matt, if the Chiefs, if you're the Chiefs, how much money do you want to pay for Orlando Brown? So perfect segue because I have it right on my rundown in front of me. It's been reported that Brown wants to be the highest paid offensive tackle in football. Now, in the last week, I've done some due diligence just asking around the league, what do you think he's worth? Where, where do you slot him? I think Brown's probably right on the borderline of being a top five offensive tackle you know, or left tackle, I should say. You know, he's probably, look, he's not 
he's not the caliber player Trent Williams is, right? Like Trent Williams is a first ballot Hall of Famer. I don't think anybody would argue that. There are some other tackles I'd also throw out there. Um, you know, Teron Armstead, when he's healthy, I would say he's a better player. Now, the problem with Teron Armstead is he's not always healthy. But when he's healthy, I think I think he's a superior player. Um, yeah, there, there are a few other guys. But I, I would put it this way. It's a, it, you know, Bakhtiari is a great player in Green Bay. Um, I would say he's in the top 10 safely, okay? He's in the top 10. Um, and you'd say, okay, well, then he deserves top 10 money. Well, maybe on merit, but you have to factor in the – leverage that he has the chiefs traded what was the equivalent to a late first early second round pick for him um and they patrick mahomes like they have to protect patrick mahomes so you're gonna pay him a lot of money now i've reported this forever my understanding and, and the chiefs have been very public about this as well but my understanding the day they traded for him was look they're gonna let him play out 2021 make sure it's a good fit Appears to be a good fit for all sides. Then throughout talking to people around the league and talking to people closer to the situation, the understanding is, look, they want to get a deal done. And like I said, that's not a secret. The Chiefs have been very public about the fact they want to get a deal done. As far as him wanting to be the highest paid left tackle in football, I said this the second I saw the comment and when I've asked people around the league about the same response. You know, no kidding. Everybody wants to be the highest paid player at their position. Doesn't mean they're going to be. Okay. I would be shocked if he's the highest paid left tackle in the NFL. Even with the fact that a lot of times when you're the guy who's the latest to negotiate, you get paid, he, he doesn't have that much leverage. He's got leverage. Just came off of a third straight Pro Bowl year, did a great job protecting Mahomes. The offensive line, you could argue, is the strength of the team right now, along with the quarterback. Okay, I would make that argument. I think he gets paid right around $21 million a year. I think that's where he slots in. And so, listen, I think he's, I think five and 105. Is is somewhere reasonable for him. I I don't think he's going to get more than that. Maybe at the most twenty two, um, but when you look at when you look at that position, I I think getting higher than that it gets tough. It gets hard to get higher than about twenty two million. I think that's the cap. And by the way, agents will tell you that when they do these contracts, the only thing they really care about are, is guaranteed money and structure. Right, like that, that is ultimately what the players should care about, what the agents certainly care about. And I think that's that's true here as well, right? Like I know when and I detail this in depth at Fanside, when the Chiefs signed Joe Tooney, the big thing was it guaranteed three full years of the contract, which most interior offensive linemen do not get more than two years. Okay. If you look around the league, the highest paid left tackle in football is Trent Williams. Okay. He averages $23 million a year, six years, 138, guaranteed signing 55.1. Now, that is not the most guaranteed money, but he also signed in his 30s. That's an incredible amount for a guy in his 30s. Ronnie Stanley got the most, which unfortunately because of injury might prove to be a disaster for Baltimore, 64.16. Bakhtiari comes in at 61.5. Ryan Ramchick, who's an excellent right tackle, comes in at 60.2. When you look at the average annual value, Okay, Williams at 23, Bakhtiari at 23, Laramie Tunzel at 22. He got 50 million guaranteed. Ronnie Stanley at 19.7. Ryan Ramashek at 19.2. I believe, I am of the belief he will get more than Stanley and more than Ramashek. He will get less than Williams and Bakhtiari. I think he comes in right around Tunzel, might be a little less, but the guarantees might be a little more. So I think I think it's reasonable based off of all those comps and what Brown's age is and everything else. I think you're probably looking at about five years, an average value of 21 to 22 million guarantees right around 60. And I got to tell you, I think that's fair for the chiefs. I think that's right. And by the way, guys, that basically means it's a three year, $60 million contract. I think that's fair. He, He deserves that. He's been a really good player. And if he keeps if he keeps Mahomes upright and on the field, he's worth every cent. Because other than Mahomes himself, there is nobody more important on that team, in my estimation, than Orlando Brown. You've got to be able to protect. And he's done a damn good job in his career. He's a three-time Pro Bowl. He's had four years. He's never missed a game. Excuse me, missed one game. 
missed one game in his career. I, that 17th game always trips me up. He's missed one game in his NFL career. And that was a game against Cincinnati where he got he tweaked something in pregame warmups. He's been very durable and he's been very good. He can play left tackle, he can play right tackle. That, to me, that's a guy never had any off field issue. You'd pay him. Um, before I go any further, and I'm going to go a little bit further on this. I'm going to segue to Tyree Kill. It's got to be said. If I wasn't coaching my daughter's soccer team later, I'd, be, I'd have one in hand right now. Kansas City Beer Company, of course. The Arrowhead Addict Podcast is brought to you by the KC Beer Company, which is the largest locally owned brewery in KC. They're also the only brewery in Kansas City to focus on German beer styles. They actually brew their beer according to the German purity law of 1516 using only four ingredients, malt, hops, water, and yeast. It's incredible. If you've ever had it, you already know this. If you haven't had it, you can get your hands on some. You got to do it right away. They got all new new different uh, kinds coming out all the time. I had the Colts the other day. I love it. I love their pills. Um, I'm not even usually a big dark beer guy, but I love the Dunkel. It's a really, really good, pure beer. And of course, 21 over, please drink responsibly. And if you're on Twitter, check them out at KC Beer Co. Beer, B-I-E-R. Okay. Back to Orlando Brown. So with Brown, and I see a lot of you guys, and I agree with you, Nate, Joshua in there, Sam. And look, Brown got better as the year went on. And I think a lot of that was that's a that's a much, much, much different offense to play in the Baltimore's, which is the concern coming in. Well, he did a hell of a job. Um, but I will say this. If you're Brown and now if you're Michael Portner's agent, you are going to have to negotiate in some good faith with Kansas City, because after what happened with Tyree Kill, they have shown that they are not going to buckle for better or worse, depending on your position on, on everything that happened with Tyree Kill. They have shown they are not going to buckle. They have the fortitude to make this is the number. And to be fair, I'd say that served the Chiefs very well under Brett Beach. They have done very, very well. I mean, think about it. What big money deal has Brett Beach signed that's gone haywire? What deal has have they have they signed under Brett Beach where you've gone, man, that really doesn't look like a good deal anymore? I would say the only one is Frank Clark. I would say Frank Clark's probably the only one, right? I mean, Sammy Watkins, you could argue one way or the other, but Sammy Watkins, to me, served his purpose. Took the defenses away from Hill and Kelsey, right? I mean, I don't think that I don't think it's a bad contract. You could argue maybe they didn't get everything they wanted out of it. I don't think it's a bad contract. Anthony Hitchens, a lot of people, including myself, kind of went, wow, they paid him a lot of money. I would say that contract ended up being fair. I don't think he, I, I think that contract ended up being right what it should have been. He performed it to the level of that deal and was a very important piece on a championship team. They have not spent bad money. You know, Tyron Matthew came in on a three or $42 million deal and was worth every single penny of it, right? I mean, Chris Jones, he's been worth the money. Tyree Kill was worth the money. Travis Kelsey's been worth every cent. Obviously, I don't think we're talking about Mahomes. Tooney's look like a, a steal, or at least if not a steal, a, a damn good player on, on a big deal. Frank Clark's about it. Frank Clark's about the only one that you look at and go, yeah, that, that was great. And I got to tell you, if it, even as much as I think everybody would agree that, yes, that contract didn't work out, bearing than what they would have been paying for D Ford, who's played, I think, six games with the 49 or something like that. But I brought up Tyree Kill as an example of why I think the Chiefs have shown, look, you need to actually negotiate with us. We're not going to be held over a barrel here. Um, so Tyree Kill has been in the news a little bit. The last couple of days because he, he teased out on, on social media, on Twitter. I don't know if he teased it out on other platforms as well. He teased out uh, a, a podcast that he has coming up on June 10th. It's going to drop. It was himself. It was his agent, Drew Rosenhaus, and it was a host in there. I don't know the name of the host offhand. And he basically alluded to the idea. The host, let's be clear. The host asked Tyreek Hill, and I'm paraphrasing. Do you feel like the Chiefs were holding down your value intentionally last season? Were they trying to tamp down your value? Obviously, you know, the contract was coming up. And Tyreek kind of pauses and makes this face like he's about to say something, and then they cut. Okay, and that's the teaser. That's cliffhanger. I think it has to be said off, off the top. Tyreek did not say in that clip that he felt like his value was tamped down. And it very well might be that when you actually hear the full podcast, if you are willing to listen to it, that he says, no, I don't feel like that at all. I feel like the Chiefs gave me every opportunity. 
But because Tyreek is kind of throwing it out there like it's it's a, a possible issue that he had, it's fair game to talk about. You could say a lot of things in the NFL about the way teams manipulate contracts and, and, and even manipulate players and you know work around incentives. That happens. Tyreek Hill was not held back in Kansas City. Ever. He played six seasons with the Chiefs. He made six Pro Bowls, and he was a three-time first-team All-Pro. And if you wanted to say, well, what about last year? What about last season? Was he held back last season? Facts say, indisputably, no, he was not held back last season. There is no reason to feel like that's true. In fact, he played 17 games last year, full year. He was targeted 159 times. It's the most in his career by 22 targets. He had 111 receptions. He had never cracked 88 before last season. He had 1,239 yards, which is third out of six seasons, and almost second, barely missed second. He had nine touchdowns, which is third in six seasons. Now, his yards per per reception was 11.2, which was the lowest since his rookie year by a healthy margin. That is not because the Chiefs were holding him back. That was because teams started playing safeties 25 yards off the line of scrimmage. And I don't think there's, that's even an argument. All you have to do is go and look at the tape. They tried to their detriment for half a season to keep throwing the ball down the field. I would also argue Tyree Kill's numbers would have been even better, but he had the worst year of his career in terms of dropping the football. Now, that happens. I mean, that's just – listen, I'm not knocking him. It's just the truth. The Chiefs did well enough by him that he got one of the biggest paydays at his position in NFL history with the Miami Dolphins. Look, the Chiefs could have played hardball on this, and a lot of teams would have. Okay, He was still under contract. He didn't leave in free agency. The Chiefs could have absolutely said, we're not trading you. We don't care. You're playing out the season. You know, he says, well, he wouldn't have played. That That's bullshit. You know why? Because in the new CBA – it's almost impossible to hold out. The, the penalties are so stiff for, for holding out under the new collective bargaining agreement. There's a reason you don't see players doing it anymore, right? You see guys show up and then they meander around and they just kind of become a, a quiet distraction, hoping for a new deal. Maybe he would have done that. Let me tell you something. Week one against the Cardinals, he'd have been on the field. Because nobody or very few guys are willing to sit out and miss what would have been for him over a million dollars a week. He to play. The Chiefs had a good faith conversation for a long period of time with Drew Rosenhaus, which Drew Rosenhaus has been publicly on the record about. I know from reporting on this dating back to January, which sources close to this situation, they were very close to getting a deal done, and the Devontae Adams blew this thing up. The Devontae Adams deal blew this thing up. I reported that before Rosenhaus even went on radio and backed it up by saying that. That that deal changed everything. So spare me this whole idea that the Chiefs were tamping down his value and that all of a sudden, you know, the, the Chiefs somehow did wrong. The Chiefs did everything right by him. They fed him the ball constantly, which, by the way, they, they should have. And as Gonzo points out, if the Chiefs knew they were going to trade him, which they didn't, they thought they were going to sign him. This if they knew they were going to trade him, they would have gotten him 150 receptions to get him even more for him. So none of this makes any sense. The Chiefs wanted to sign him this year. What, what did people think? Like, if the Chiefs somehow held down his statistics this year artificially to hurt their championship chances, that they would have been able to sign him for a, you know, a two-year, $20 million deal. I mean, Christian Kirk just got four years and $84 million. He's never had 1,000 yards in a season. Come on. That is something – like, I, I don't deal in BS arguments for a lot of things in life. That's a BS argument. And I don't know why Tyreek Hill would be upset about it. He got to Miami, which, look, he wanted to be in Kansas City, which he also said in that teaser, which I've reported for months on end. He wanted to be in Kansas City. This is not a situation where he forced himself out. But when the deal wasn't going to be on the table that he and his representation felt he deserved, which he does deserve, at that point the Chiefs said, we're not going to go that route. We're not going to give you that amount of money. You can seek a trade. Then it became, hey, Miami's got the capital. It matches up. He's got a home there. Go, go with God. Go ahead. That's what happened. Sometimes it's Oakham's razor, right? Like the most simple answer is the obvious one, or the most obvious answer is the correct answer. That's the correct answer. That's what happened. 
That is honestly what happened. And he now is in Miami, rich as can be, with a ring on his finger. He should be thrilled. He should be thrilled. But there is starting to be this weird, like, obsession about Kansas City and the Chiefs and what did and didn't happen. Look, go play with Tua and go have 1,500 yards. Go have the career year you, you, you hope you have. Go to the playoffs and beat the Chiefs. Because I got to tell you, you know, you don't, you hear a lot of this stuff out of the, out of Hill's camp, the Chiefs. You don't hear any of it out of Kansas City with Tyreek Hill. They've moved on, just as Hill should. The Chiefs have moved on. They went out and got Marcus Valdez Scantling and Sky Moore, and they brought in Juju Smith Schuster, and they're going to go out and try to win 17 games. Fall short of that goal, unless they have a perfect season, but they're going to try to win 17 games. So for me, this has become bizarre to a degree here. Like, just move on. You got your money. You you are in Miami. It's a hell of a place to live. You'll be all right. And I got to tell you, the Chiefs are going to be just fine. Like, I think he is a big loss. He changes the way you're covered. I also think it provides a lot of opportunity for the Chiefs. So we'll go from there. Okay, I think that I said in my piece on that. But it is becoming a little bit like, look, it's over. It's over. You got trade. You want, you want, once you realized you weren't going to get Devontae Adams money, and I understand that we so you want it out. Now you're out. Go play in Miami. Go put up 13, 14, 1500 yards. Go turn two into a pro bowler. That, that, that should be the focus right now for Tyreek Hill. Shouldn't be about Kansas City. Kansas City's done. It's over. You turned in that uniform. All right. So I'm going to get to Justin Ross in a minute, but I was thinking as I was writing out the outline for the show, what is there to talk about outside of Orlando Brown and Tyreek Hill? And I, I don't want to spend an hour on those two subjects because I feel like you just belabor the point to belabor it. Well, thought about it, one thing we haven't really talked about, at least on the show Patrick and I do, maybe uh, you know, uh, Matt Connor, Sterling Holmes, who, by the way, I love the guests we've been having on lately, um, have touched on a little bit of it, and I, I can't remember if they have. You know, a lot of years you look at training camp and it always comes into the, you know, the training camp battle, right? The training camp competitions. Who's going to be there? Who's not going to be there? Uh, you know, what what are be the big um I don't I don't I'm trying to think of, a, of the right word. What are going to be the big competitions for starting roles? I don't know if the Chiefs have many. And that's pretty common with the Chiefs the last handful of years cuz they're just so damn talented. When you look at this roster, there's always back of the of the depth chart fights for spots, right? I mean, that's that's always going to be part of training camp for every team on a Kahuya. You're always going to have turnover in the back end of the roster. But um, I got to take the Chiefs. I feel like you pretty much can pencil in, you know, with health, most of these guys. Offensively, and this is where I think there's the, the biggest conversation. Who's going to be the starter at running back, right? And, and and I don't even know how much of a conversation that is because realistically, realistically, you have Ronald Jones who you've brought in. You have Clyde Edwards-Alaire, who, of course, you already have. And you're going to share time with those guys as my my daughter here is jumping into the, jumping into the conversation for a minute if you're watching live. Um, look. I think realistically speaking, Jones and Edwards and Lair, along with Gore, they're going to split carries to some effect. And then other than that, what are you really worried about? You know, in terms of trying to figure out, I think the receivers, maybe, I mean, one through four, how does that shake? Although I think it's really going to be by committee. I don't think there's going to be a whole lot of, um, you know, this guy's our clear number one receiver. I mean, Kelsey's their number one receiver. But when they go three wide, it's going to be Juju, I would imagine, and MVS. And then after that, Sky Moore and Hardman, right? I mean, I think that's probably the main, you know, how does that shake out? Who, who does Sky Moore take targets away from? And I think it's probably just going to be kind of split up fairly evenly between those other three vets. Like, I, I don't think you'll look at it and say that say that Sky Moore is going to just start over all the rest of these guys. Maybe, maybe you have a situation where Moore's just so good out of the gate that all of a sudden he's just getting – Tons of snaps, which would be great for the Chiefs. You'd sign for that. But I think it's going to be he's going to kind of rotate in with those three vets. And then you're going to you're going to see how it unfolds. The offensive line, you already know. 
right? QB, of course, you know, tight end. Gonzo says the room's kind of crowded, which is true, but Kelsey's going to be the leader of the pack there. And then after that, it's going to be, I, I think, honestly, I think Jody Fortson, if he's healthy, is, is tight end too. Uh, he played well last season. I, I think he's the guy. He gives them some versatility, some flexibility. You know, maybe right tackle, maybe right tackle, but I don't know that Yang's going to be ready. Torn Patella right around New Year's. That's a tough one, man. I got to think Wiley's the guy. Although, you know, that is kind of the dark horse spot to watch this year, right tackle, right? That is kind of the dark horse spot because you've got Wiley, who you know can do a serviceable job. He's not great. He's never going to make a Pro Bowl, but he doesn't get you killed. You've got Niang, who flashed last year at times. At times was very good. At times was shaky, but he's coming off a big injury. Then you've got Kennard in the fifth round, who I remember speaking to a source on him uh, right after he was picked, somebody who was, who was familiar with him, very familiar with him, and said, look, this kid is a beast in the run game. He's got heavy hands. He's a, he's a big, strong kid. He's got to refine himself in the pass game a little bit. And obviously, if you're the Chiefs, you better be really refined to attack on the pass game if you want to step on the field, uh, at least in theory. That is probably, along with running back, the, the, the two areas where I'm watching and saying, oh, that's going to be interesting to see how they go about it. Like D-line, even though it's a point of weakness, I don't know if there's a lot of competition, right? It's Clark and Karloff, this, and then it's Jones, and then you know, you'll have a rotation inside based on runner pass. Linebackers, you know who they are, safeties, you know who they are, corners, you know who they are. So I think it's gonna be a if it's gonna be interesting to see how right tackle and running back shake for me. That that's and Joshua points out, you know, does Nyang start on the pup or the IR to free up the 53 spot? It might might very well. No, I don't think they would put him there just to put him there. But if he's still hurt, yeah, probably. Um, but it's going to be interesting. I, I think actually, I think running back, which again, you guys split carries these days so much. I don't think you're really looking at like a really true, honest to God breakdown of, oh, well, you know, if Ronald Jones is the starter, then he's getting 80% of the snaps. Because that's not going to happen. So right tackle is the interesting dark horse one. I think we'll kind of get over and look a little bit because the rest of the line is so entrenched. But that's a really interesting one. And then, yes, running back and then and then Sky Moore, how does he fit in with some of these veteran guys? Um, I'm, I'm very curious to see how it all shakes out. Um, and uh, Sam asks, can Leo, Leo Chanal, the rookie, who, by the way, just signed his contract a day or two ago, uh, can he play on the line on passing and passing downs? You know what? He's a big blitzer. He was a really good blitzer in Wisconsin. I don't know if they play him on the line, but I, I could see them kind of playing, if you want to call this the line, like the wide nine, you know, like way off the edge. I think they'll move him around a lot is what I think is going to happen with him. I, I think I think you're going to see him, you know, back behind the A-gap, then off to the side, then off to the edge. I think you're going to see – I think you're going to see a pretty good amount of, of movement with him. That's kind of what Spagnolo does. So those are a couple things to watch. Now I wanted to get, and I feel like we talk about him every week. And again, this is, it's, it's June. It's Justin Ross. There has been this wave of enthusiasm based off of a, he was a hell of a player in college before he got injured. B, he has that, that one handed grab in OTAs. Everybody's going crazy about it. I will say this for Justin Ross. I truly believe he's very talented. I mean, if you watch this tape at Clemson, you can see that. There's also a reason he was a UDFA. His injuries are very significant. Doesn't mean it can't work out. Doesn't mean it won't pan out. Trey Smith was taken off a lot of boards, and I'd say he worked out, okay, at least to this point. I also think it's fair to say there's a reason that nobody took him. And Unfortunately for him, because of the medical situation, he's a lot to prove. He has a lot to prove. Now, that being said, he is not your typical UDFA. That kid has immense, immense talent. And so you look at him and go, okay, well, how does he fit in? The one thing I would caution people, I see, I've literally had people ask me, is he going to be their wide receiver one? Guys, if he's that, you can just. Pencil them into the Super Bowl. I mean, if, if that kid goes from a UDFA to the number one receiver on this team, nobody's beating them. I think a realistic 
expectation for him, if you want to be a positive person about him, makes a team, makes a 53, plays some specials, and he rotates in kind of like we saw Byron Pringle, you know, those first couple of years when he was first getting himself acclimated. It's just too hard of a lineup to crack. You're going to tell me that all of a sudden he's going to jump up is gonna is gonna jump ahead and, and and be ahead of Juju and MVS and Hardman. Even Sky Moore is a fellow rookie, but it was a second round pick. You have an investment in him. It's gonna be really hard for him to be higher than wide receiver five on this team. Now, look, they're not blind. If he comes in and he looks like Jesus Christ in cleats, okay, they'll they'll play him. But I think a fair expectation makes the roster. Special teams, you know, and if things work out, three to 400 yards. And if he does that, that's a great UDFA signing. Now, if he does more than that, awesome. But I think people are setting themselves up for expectations to crush them if it's like, well, I think he's going to have 800 yards this year. If he has 800 yards this year, he's one of the best UDFA signings in the last 20 years. I, I mean, you're just... You're asking so much of a kid who's been besieged by injuries, who's learning a new offense, obviously, coming in as a rookie. You are asking a lot, a lot of that kid, especially with all these guys in front of you. It'd be one thing if he came in and, hey, you know, they had nobody ahead of him, and it's like, you know, they stunk. Okay, then, yeah, maybe he has a big year because there's, there's so much opportunity. You know, but he's not on the Texans. He he's not on he's not on the Falcons. He's on a team that has so many guys. It's going to be very hard for him to just ascend rapidly. Even though you always have to throw the caveat of look, he's going to get a he, he's going to get a shot. They're going to look at him, and if he goes out in camp in the preseason and he is just dominant, maybe look it happens. I'll never forget growing up in New York, Victor Cruz with the Giants. I was I I hate the preseason in the NFL. I just think it's a waste of time and guys get hurt. But I remember watching him just destroy the Jets in the Snoopy Bowl at MetLife. Where I think it was number three. I think they can't stop this kid. This kid's unbelievable. Well, it turned out he's a great player. But that's a rare, rare, rare thing. A rare thing. And uh Yoder05 says, do you think Ross plays specials with his medical concerns, specifically the spinal fusion stuff? It's a fair question. I've thought about that. I think if you're on the bottom portion of the wide receiver depth, I think you kind of have to. And that factors in. Like, the Chiefs have to be comfortable with him doing that. But you have to, right? I mean, if, if you can't do that, it's a major strike against you making the team. So that's, that's where I, I look at this. And I think, listen, could he make the team? I think he will make the team if he's healthy. But I think anything over, you know, maybe you, you want you know 400 yards or something, that's a big expectation for a kid coming in as a UDFA with all the injury history and getting himself right and everything else and developing chemistry with Mahomes. It's a lot. It's a lot to ask. So that's that's where I think we're at there. Now, another quick announcement. Look, if you like the Arrowhead Attic podcast, please consider becoming a member of the AA family. Arrowhead Attic members get access to special emojis, loyalty badges you can use during the live YouTube streams like one, like this one right now. Okay. They also get invited to a private Discord where they can hang out with the AA hosts, talk Chiefs football, movies, beers, you name it. We talk about everything in there. Uh, it's, it's, it's very active all the time, especially during the season. It's insanely active. Um, members also get invite to, invites excuse me, to private events like virtual happy hours. I'm at every one of those. It's a lot of fun. We crack open a beer. We have a good time. We talk football. We talk life. Check for the link about joining in the description of wherever you get this podcast. And, of course, as always, we appreciate your support. So uh, one other thing I thought was just this is more of a fun thing. Although, I, actually, real quick, before I get into this, I want to read. Um, I, we always try to get to all the, all the reviews, which we always we appreciate so much. And last week, we were running up against time, and we weren't able to get to them. And I, I promised that the next show we did, I would get to them good, bad, otherwise. We always read them all. We don't shy away from any of them. Um, and that's certainly going to be true here. So I'm going to read a few of these real quick. Um, and then I have one more topic I want to get to. It's a little bit more fun. So, all right, let me pull up. Um, if, all right, so I, if I remember right, if I remember right, 
I, I, we have we have five I didn't get to read. So uh, and a couple of them I don't think were even posted yet for the last show. So five stars from Clinton McKenzie. Clint's our guy. He's been here since the beginning. Uh, he even mentions in the argument, guys, I'm provoked to a fault. You don't have to read this whole thing. Uh, if it'll slow things down, I want you to bring listeners, not drive them away. Clint, we appreciate it. Like the bottom line is Clint is always saying, you know, it's it's a it's a first rate podcast and it's, it's something to enjoy and to listen. And, and we appreciate it so much. Uh, he says there are four, occasional forays into non-Chiefs content. Don't dissuade me from listening at all. It's quite the opposite for me, in fact. Uh, if I just want to have the Chiefs info vomited all over me, there are plenty of other options out there. For that, with this podcast, I get all of that, plus lots of fun real-world conversations from guys I care about. You'll love it just as I do. Thank you, Clint. It's very kind. Um, really appreciate it. Um, and then, look, there was – so then we had a few more um, – we had, let's see, a JMB58 is a football podcast on Home Talk Football. Unfortunately, the football uh, podcast hosts think talking about their ideologies, leanings, and topics outside of their scope of expertise attracts listeners. It makes them unlistenable. It was a one star. We did get a two star uh, from Football 2132. Decent show at times, but after each episode, I'm always left wondering when Keith Olbermann will become the third wheel on each episode. Never met Keith. He seems like the missing link between the brief football talk and lib opinions. Um, Listen, those obviously kind of go hand in hand. Look, we have obviously touched on a lot of stuff here in the last week, especially after the, the shooting in Buffalo, then the Uvalde tragedy. Um, I get it. You, I get it. But sometimes we're more than just football people. Although we do, we do make a genuine effort to talk football as much as humanly possible. Because let's face it, that's what we're here for, right? And that's what we're trying to get away. We're trying to get away from these these tragedies. That, puts a pull on everybody. And I thought to, to Christopher uh, Galakutis, and I, I apologize, Christopher, I didn't pronounce your name right. Can't say how people don't pronounce my name right. So I apologize if I screwed that up. Hopefully I got it right. He left a really insightful, thoughtful remark that I, I really want to touch on because it, it, it made me think. So he just said, Matt V, right? I must say I was not surprised by your response to the one-star comment you spoke about this past Thursday. I'm not surprised, but I'm disappointed. If you missed my comment, I essentially told the guy to shove it. Um, have you spent the requisite 10 to 20,000 hours studying the non-sports issues you used to tweet about? It doesn't seem like you have. If you wish to see changes to the country with regards to some of the issues, then write about politics or why not run for office and put all your energies towards that goal, which would be admirable. Otherwise, yours is just another hat in the ignoramus ring on Twitter. We follow you guys and listen in to get away from the poisonous rhetoric that is ripping our country apart. What does any of this have to do with sports or the Chiefs in particular anyway? Not condoning cancel culture in any way, but some of us don't have to follow such voices on Twitter or listen on Thursdays. Respectfully yours and good luck. Go Chiefs. Wise men learn by others' harms, fools by their own. It's a quote from Benjamin Franklin. I really enjoyed that. And he left a five-star review, which is very nice. Um, real quick, because I don't want to go on and on, right? Because that's kind of the point of that whole thing. But um, I thought that was well put for the most part. And I, I agree with a decent amount of it. Look, I'm... I'm not running for office because I'm not a politician. I'm an NFL reporter and an insider, and that's what I do for a living. Again, I grew up a Chiefs fan, so we have this podcast. I will say this. I have a lot of titles in my life, just like I'm sure all of you do. My title when I'm on this show, I'm an NFL reporter. I'm Chiefs insider. That's why I'm here. It's why you guys listen. And I'm very grateful for every one of you that listens. But occasionally, sometimes, things happen in life that merit stepping away from football for five minutes because it weighs heavy on your heart, heavy on your soul, heavy on your mind. And sometimes you're a human being before you're an NFL reporter. I will tell you, look, when I lost my son, which was now 14 months ago, I talked about it here on Sack in the Box. That is a non-football thing. I know it's not a divisive thing. I get it. But some things are more important. And especially in a time where there's not a lot going on in football, every once in a while that's going to come up. And I get the people who say, look, man, I don't want to hear your politics. And that's fine. That's fine. But you do have to understand that before being an NFL reporter, I'm a father, I'm an American, I'm a person. And I think sometimes those things are going to be part of the show because my personality is also why you're here, or Patrick Allen's personality, or Matt Connor, whatever the case may be. It's fair to not want to hear politics crammed down your throat. I don't either. 
But if you come to the show and you listen, and there's five minutes of my opinion on something every once in a while, and it is only every once in a while, I don't think it's too much to ask to say either, listen, it's okay. You can deal with it or you can fast forward. It's not going to kill you. But I do, I do respect the person that says, and well written, I might add, from Chris, that sometimes it's okay. It's okay to venture outside the realm. And we don't all have to hate each other for it. We don't have to hate each other. Because, you know, in this case, I feel like gun reform would be a good thing. I don't hate the person who doesn't feel that way. You shouldn't hate the person who feels the other way. And that's the device that Mr. Chris was talking about, and I agree with him. We've gotten to the point now where it's way, way, way too hard to just shake somebody's hand and go, I disagree with you, but I respect you. We can all move forward. All right, I'll leave it at that. So there was one more thing I wanted to get to here before we break the show. And that is, you know, obviously the schedule came out about three weeks ago now. And we, we did a whole show on it. And and we we broke down the whole schedule. And, of course, you know, there's some pockets where things are easy, some pockets where things are tough, so on and so forth. And, of course, you never really know because the, 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 the season is such, you know, you can have a team that's ravaged by injuries. You could have a team that's better than you thought. I mean, nobody thought the Bengals was going to be a tough game, right? It turns out they beat the Chiefs twice last year. I'm looking at the schedule, and the Chiefs, of course, play a very hard schedule, so there's a lot of really good games. Um, but which game is the most important to them? Not which is going to be the best or the most entertaining or the highest score. Which is going to be the most important? And it's, a, I think, an interesting discussion. I'm curious to see what you guys say in the chat because you could go a lot of different ways here. I mean, obviously, any of the six divisional games are important, Okay. Um, you could say the Bills because you're fighting maybe for home field. You could say the Bengals for revenge. You could, I don't know that you could say one of the games against the NFC teams. You know, I don't, I don't know that you could go that route just because the tiebreakers and whatnot. They're probably the least important games on the schedule. But you could make an argument for about half the games on their slate. You really could. Um, I think when I look at it, and Gonzo says weeks one through four don't really matter. I don't know if I'd go that far because in football, it's only 17 games. They all matter. Um, and I think you could, again, I, I do believe there's a million different directions you can go. I would actually go against the grain here with Gonzo. I think week two against the Chargers is a really important game. And and I and Cheeto Freaks decided to avoid picking the divisions, you know, because the division always is more important. If I went non division, I would definitely go Buffalo. Um, just because I think they're the two best teams in the conference. But I'm saying the Chargers for this reason. It's week two. It's a Thursday night game. It's a home opener. If you let's say let's say that the Chiefs were to win that that opener against Arizona, okay. Let's just say let's say they were to win that. And they're one and zero going into this game. Well, if you beat the Chargers all of a sudden, you're at least a game up, and they play the Raiders the first week, so it's it's tough to say whether or not, you know, they'd be zero and one and one now. You'd be at least a game up, and you'd have the early break. And of course, the Chargers can break back. They play them later in the year. I understand all that. They play them, I believe, in late November. But it also sets a tone. Like, if you beat the Cardinals and then you win that game and you beat the Chargers, I'm a big believer in momentum. I know there are people who don't believe in momentum. That's I, I do. And I think there's a – especially in football, there's only 17 games. And, and I, If you go in there, the Chargers are supposed to be so good this year. If they go to Kansas City, where they won last season and then lost, of course, the other way, if you win that game – I think that puts the Chargers in a spot where right off the bat, first of all, they're behind you. And it's like, man, God, we, we had all these guys. They don't have Tyree Kill. They don't have Tyre Matt, And they still won the game. I don't think the Raiders are a serious contender in the division. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm way off base. I think the Raiders are the worst team in the division. I think they're talented, but I think they're just in the wrong division. The Broncos and Gonzo says the Broncos games are going to be telling. And that's true. Those games are late in the year. They're, they're both back half of the schedule games. Those could very well. I mean, the Chiefs, especially the one at home, I think it's week 16 without looking at the schedule right in front of me. 
that could be for the division, depending on how good Denver is. And Denver's early slate's really easy. Denver's probably going to get out to a little bit of a lead. If they beat the Chargers in week two, I really do think that puts the Chargers on their heels a little bit right off the bat. And if you lose that game, then you're potentially behind the Chargers. They've already beaten you in your building. You've got to play catch up. Now, the Chiefs did that last year. The Chiefs were a couple games behind the Chargers, and they lost at home. They ended up catching them, no problem. But I do think that game, especially if it's a short week, it's a home opener. Like, that's a, you know, that's a big spot. The Chargers are going to come in giving it everything they've got, but they're going to be coming off a divisional game. The Chiefs are coming off a non-conference against a team that, I got to be honest, I think they should beat in Arizona, especially without DeAndre Hopkins. And then on top of that, you know, you're getting them on a short week coming coming across the country to play the Chiefs. You're at home. And the Chiefs are always – now, last year was the was kind of the oddity, okay? The Chiefs are usually always very good to start the season. Like, Mahomes has lost one game his entire career in September. It's an opportunity to hold – like, if they can beat the Cardinals and hold back some things, they can just unload on the Chargers. And there's nothing the Chargers can do about it. Right, like in terms of preparing for, I mean, they can they can play well and win the game, but they can't prepare for it because they haven't seen it. Chiefs have so many changes. I think that's worth talking about. Um, and and I really do believe that is a really really critical game, even though it's week two. It's not to say that they couldn't come back from it if they lost. I mean, of course they could, but I I think. You go out of Arizona and you win, and then you play the Chargers and you win. And all of a sudden, you're two and zero. You've got a, a lead on the Chargers of at least one game, maybe even two, you have a mini buy, and then you go play the Colts. So I respect the Colts, but the Chiefs are probably favored in that game. Like that, I think it would put the Chiefs in a really good spot. But I think week two is a big one, even though it's week two. Um, and like I said, if I was going non-division, I'd go with the Bills. Okay, that's week six, which is early. Last year they played in week five. It's at Arrowhead. And it's a game where you look at it and go, Maybe the Chiefs are fighting for the home field advantage title with them, right? I mean, maybe you're trying to get that number one seed. Um, and I, I find it really interesting. I, I, I really – like that – look, the Bills' schedule, even though the division isn't that tough comparatively, it's a hard schedule. Like Miami's not going to be a rollover in either game. And New England's never a rollover because of, because of Belichick. The Bills have to play the NFC – excuse me, the AFC North. And the NFC North, actually, as it, as it happens. Okay, they have to play the Packers. They have to play the Vikings. They do get them at home. They have to play at Baltimore. They have to play Cincinnati. They have to play Cleveland. At Cleveland, you don't know what that's going to look like because you don't know where Deshaun Watson is going to be. They have to go to Arrowhead, of course. They have to play Tennessee. Buffalo's also starting the season, the whole season for everybody, on Thursday night against, against L.A. and the Rams. Right? I mean, so I think there's a chance that the Chiefs do step back record-wise this year, maybe they're not 13 and four or they're 14 and three or last year, obviously 12 and five. Maybe they go 11 and six. Maybe. I think I picked them to go 12 and five. I think, I think they will repeat last year's record because when I look at them, I still think this team is really talented. The big question with this team is how quickly does that defense come together? But that's the conversation we can have all seasons for another day. which we're going to wrap up here in a minute, but I think it's, uh, it's really, really interesting. Um, just looking at the way the schedule shakes, you can pick a lot of games, but for me, I think it's week two. And if you're if you're ruling those out, then I'm saying week six against Buffalo. It's a huge game. Um, Jalen asked, by the way, and this is a worthwhile question. Will I be able to view Prime Video if I don't have Amazon Prime for Thursday Night Football? Uh, no, you will not. That is an exclusive situation. So you better be at the stadium or have Amazon Prime. Um, that that's where. That's where the NFL has gone through their Sunday package. It'll be commentated by uh, Al Michaels and, and Kirk Herbstreet. So keep an eye out there. Apparently, Ryan Fitzpatrick, who retired. By the way, honorary Chiefs Hall of Famer, Ryan Fitzpatrick, retired today. Uh, after after 17 years in the arena, kudos to him. A really memorable, if not great career, but a memorable one. And certainly left a lasting image and imprint for the Chiefs. Um, knocking out the Patriots, or knocking down the Patriots, I should say. In 2019, from a second seed to a third seed, and led in a lot of ways to the Chiefs winning the Super Bowl that season. And that's something, of course, we all owe him a debt of gratitude for. I know the Chiefs sent him some stuff. Um, should send him a ring. 
All right. I want to say thank you to everybody for listening in. I know we're kind of in the middle of the offseason. There's not a lot going on. Although today there actually was some stuff going on with Brown hiring an agent and this stuff with Tyreek Hill and so on and so forth. I know it was just me. Hopefully I didn't bore you to death. Um, I appreciate you listening in. We'll be back uh, next Tuesday. It'll be the usual Matt Connor uh, helming the situation with Sterling Holmes. And then on Thursday, I'll be right back here in the seat. And I believe Patrick Allen will be back joining me for that show. Uh, Until then, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Uh, And we look forward to talking to you next week. Take care, everybody.